Paleo Runner Podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes and click Ratings and Reviews. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash RunPaleo or on Twitter at RunPaleo. I wanted to take a minute to let you know about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates to use as a fuel source. Unlike sugar sports drinks, 3Fuel gets absorbed slowly into your bloodstream to give you sustained energy throughout your workout. If you'd like to give it a try, you can get 10% off by using the coupon code 3F also. My guest today is Paul Jaminet. Paul is author of The Perfect Health Diet and he blogs at perfecthealthdiet.com. He and his wife, Xiao Ching, wrote the, wrote the Perfect Health Diet after struggling with some personal health issues. Paul and his wife are both scientists and Paul has a PhD in physics well, his wife is a molecular biologist and cancer researcher at Harvard. Paul, this is your third time back on the show. It's great to have you on today. Oh, hi, Aaron. It's great to be with you. Um, Paul, you know, every time I, I go back and read your book, I, I always find new things and uh, things that I can do to try to enhance my athletic performance and just overall health. And uh, the last time I read your book, I actually listened to it on Audible, and I, I Found that I found that was a great way to catch some extra tips. If people are interested in that, they can go to my website, paleorunner.org, and they can get a free download. But, you know, one of the things I took more seriously after reading it the second time was this idea of supplementation. I'd always been scared of supplements because I heard that, um, you know, I've seen, I saw some studies in, in the newspapers that um, people who took multivitamins actually had a higher um, increase of um, death and weren't really any healthier, but you gave some really good arguments for why we should supplement and how it might possibly help us out as far as just overall health and and I would think probably help with athletic performance. Can you go into some of the, the details of why you think supplements might be important? Yeah, well the main issue is um, we need a lot of nutrients in order for our bodies to perform well. And it's relatively easy to become deficient in some of them. And uh, now it's true that uh, multivitamins don't seem to help much. Uh, people who take multivitamins seem to be seem to have about the same health as people who don't. Uh, and you know, taking them doesn't seem to reduce disease risk. Uh, but multivitamins, I think it's pretty clear, are not optimally designed. Uh, to nourish us because most of them just give you a hundred percent of the RDA of everything except the things that are too bulky to fit into a pill and it turns out the things that are bulky are also the ones people tend to be most efficient in like magnesium or vitamin C um, or there may be uh, forms of them that don't fit in as well like fat soluble uh, vitamins don't necessarily fit it properly uh, in a uh, powdered uh, capsule. And so, uh, you know, they end up giving you an excess of things that you don't need because many things uh, you'll get 100% of what you need from food and adding another 100% might give you too much. Uh, so you get too much of some things and you'll still be deficient in some other things because they just can't fit them in a pill. And, you know, so a lot of multivitamins are really designed for commercial purposes more than health improvement. Um, you know, but selected supplementation, if you actually take things you're deficient in and don't take things that you don't need, uh, really should improve health. And a lot of people do experience improved health when they supplement intelligently. Mm -hmm. So one, I think one of the main things that you had against um, multivitamins was that they're often high in vitamin A and low in vitamin D and you point out that there's a lot of synergy between the different nutrients that we take and so your recommendations are pretty specific and um, for example I, th I think you you recommend uh, getting your vitamin A from a nutrient dense animal source like liver um, what are some of those nutrients that work in synergy and that we need to be aware of as we're supplementing <laughs> Yeah, so vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, that's a great group, um, and that's really important, so let's start with that. Um, vitamin A, you're right, we do recommend getting them from foods because 
Uh, foods that are vitamin A rich are also rich in lots of other nutrients and there. It's really good to include them in your diet. And the best thing to do, we think, is to eat about a quarter pound of liver per week. Um, and then also eat plenty of carotenoid-rich plants like spinach and other green leafy vegetables and uh, the orange-yellow plants like sweet potatoes, carrots, persimmons, uh, those sorts of things. So the green leafy vegetables and the orange-yellow ones. And, uh, you know, if you eat uh, plenty of those, you should have good vitamin A status and you won't need to supplement. Uh, multivitamins, they used to have a lot of vitamin A, too much, and so that generated bad health results. Um, and as a result of those uh, studies, the multivitamin manufacturers have scaled back the vitamin A and multivitamins. So they're actually uh, not that bad now, um, and most people probably benefit from the vitamin A and the multivitamins because they don't eat liver. But um, you know, but that's a great interaction, uh, a great example of interactions because vitamin D in order to work needs vitamin A. Also thyroid hormone in order to work properly needs vitamin A. Uh, the reason is, uh, in a technical sense, is that they can't influence gene expression uh, without vitamin A uh, because uh, the transcription factors that change gene expression are actually what's called heterodimers. They're composed of vitamin A and vitamin D, uh, or thyroid hormone and vitamin A. Uh, so uh, if you don't have vitamin A, then uh, your vitamin D isn't going to be effective. Um, and there's a lot of interactions like that. So for instance, zinc and copper interact uh, because their main use in the body is to create a compound called zinc copper superoxide dismutase, uh, which is probably the most important antioxidant that, that's extracellular outside your cells. You know, so it coats the side of blood vessels and helps get rid of uh, oxidative uh, compounds. And so, uh, if you um, if you have a deficiency of one of them and getting more of the other one uh, will tend to grab it, put it into uh, the zinc copper superoxide dismutase, and then you can have a real deficiency elsewhere. And so if you have too much copper, that can tend to induce a zinc deficiency. If you have too much zinc, um, it can lead to a copper deficiency. So you want to keep those in balance. Um, and so good sources of zinc are things like oysters, uh, good sources of copper, are things like liver uh, from uh, ruminants like uh, beef or lamb and uh, things like dark chocolate and nuts and so it's important to get enough of both of them so if you're deficient in copper you'll tend to get heart disease and if you're deficient in zinc you'll have all kinds of problems so uh, you need enough of both but you also need them in the right ratios and if you don't eat oysters often, we recommend supplementing zinc, uh, but you should get enough uh, copper from eating liver, which we strongly recommend. Um, so that's another example. And there are various nutrients that interact to support bone health uh, and to inter that interact in other ways. So, uh, you know, for instance, a good example is the uh, methylation system uh, in which uh, choline and uh, folate, folic acid, and several of the B vitamins, vitamin B6, B12, uh, contribute. And, uh, and those interactions, you know, failing to appreciate those interactions have led to some historic mistakes. So what we really want to do to have well-functioning methylation is to get plenty of choline in our diets and have a normal, normal amount of folate. But most people are choline deficient because they don't eat liver, they don't eat egg yolks. And uh, it's really valuable to get lots of liver and egg yolks into your diet. And, uh, but what happens if you're short in choline, you can partially make up for that by taking extra folate. And, uh, and people figured out that for that reason, 
Uh, supplementing folic acid could reduce neural tube defects in pregnant women a little. So they started fortifying cereal grains with folic acid and putting them in all multivitamins and getting prenatal vitamins to have double the normal dose. And people have been overdosing on folic acid. Uh, and they're still deficient in choline. So, um, you know, so folic acid is actually, if your choline status is good, you don't need to supplement it at all. You'll get a perfect amount just from food. Um, and, you know, so it's good to eat like a nutritious diet, include some spinach and green leafy vegetables in your diet, and eat liver and egg yolks, and then you should have good methylation status. Um, so, uh, you know, I could go on. There's more interactions. For instance, you want to have omega-6 fats and omega-3 fats in balance. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you get the idea. It's Nutrition is a complex system, and you need to have everything, you know, all of the nutrients uh, in order to really have optimal health. You know, you mentioned there the omega-6 to the omega-3 ratio, and I've always wondered, why is it the ratio that's important? Why isn't it the absolute amount? I mean, if you get, an, if you get enough of one or too much of the other, what's, what's going to happen? Why is, why is that ratio so important? Well, the ratio, um, the, the absolute amounts are important too. Uh, so most people get an excess of omega-6, and you know, no matter how much omega-3 they take, they're not going to fix all of the problems that the excess of omega-6 cause. Um, but uh, it's important to be balanced because uh, your cell membranes want to have a certain ratio. And, um, and some animals have, or, or yeast, have genes that automatically maintain the optimal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in membranes. So they have a gene for converting omega-6 to omega-3 or omega-3 to omega-6. And we don't have that gene. Uh, mice don't have it either. But they've done experiments where they put that gene into mice. And, uh, and those mice are much healthier. Uh, they live longer. They have stronger bones. They're more athletic. Um, so just permanently maintaining a good ratio, you know, that that gene enforces like a 50-50 ratio, where if you have more omega-6 than omega-3, it converts the omega-6 to omega-3. If you have more omega-3 than omega-6, it converts the excess omega-3 to omega-6. So, you know, just having that uh, enzyme can improve uh, the health of the mice. And there's every reason to think from studies in humans that uh, if people balance out their omega-6s and omega-3s, that's going to be good for them, too. So, um, you know, so there's, there's various lines of evidence that having a balance is important as well as, you know, having good absolute amounts. But you definitely do want the right absolute amounts. If you have a deficiency, uh, then balancing them will just make you deficient in both. And if you have uh, an excess, then balancing them will give you an excess of both. So, uh, so you really want to get balance, but at the proper levels. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul, can we get enough nutrients just through diet alone? I know, you know, I I've been skeptical in the past of taking supplements, but um, you know, I've I've for about two months now I've been taking your recommended supplements. And uh, if people are interested in that, they can actually find the supplements you recommend on your website um, under the recommended supplements tab. And what do you say to people who say, well, there, what about all the studies with the multivitamins that show that um, people have a higher uh, risk of uh, dying from taking a multivitamin supplement? Are those studies accurate? Uh, no, actually. Um, I mean, even if I've, I've blogged about... Uh, those studies, and even if, if you look at them, in the raw data, the people who take the supplements have lower mortality than the, the people who don't. Mm. And the people who take the supplements are older than the people who don't, and, you know, older people are more likely to die. So, uh, you know, there's actually, it looks, you know, if you just look at uh, the raw numbers, it looks like the supplements are really helping people. Uh, but for, you know, kind of political reasons and other reasons, there's, uh, 
you know, these analyses, uh, you can introduce a lot of confounders and correct for them. And if you choose the right set of confounders, then you can turn anything, uh, because the effects are relatively small, into, you know, from positive to negative. And that's what they tend to do. You know, like uh, these studies, you know, the one that got a, a lot of press uh, last year and has been uh, cited in The Atlantic in an article by Paul Offit and in other places in The New York Times as evidence that uh, supplementation is harmful. Um, you know, that one, they only got them to be harmful using... Uh, analyses that corrected for 11 to 16 variables. And the variables they chose are really peculiar. You know, like they corrected for obesity and diabetes. Well, if supplements, if uh, the main disease they help you with is obesity and diabetes, then, uh, then you're going to make them look a lot worse. Uh, whereas, you know, if they had chosen other diseases, and not the obesity and diabetes, then uh, that analysis would have made the supplements look a lot better. So you're basically removing credit when you do that kind of analysis. You're removing credit uh, from the supplements for all the benefits they have in avoiding obesity and diabetes and any negative health effects like higher mortality that comes with them. And, um, you know, so it's sort of a counterfactual situation. You know, you could have, you know, suppose uh, the supplements completely removed mortality from diabetes and they cut mortality by 20%, but if in your analysis the people who don't take supplements die 25% of the time from diabetes, then, uh, you know, then you think correcting for the diabetes would reduce mortality by 25%, the supplements only reduced to 20%, so you say the supplements raised mortality by 5%. Mm. So that's how that analysis works. And even though they may have reduced mortality by 20%, you show them as having a negative effect. Mm. And, um, you know, so you basically can't trust any of these analyses with the correct for 16 variables, especially when they choose them arbitrarily and they don't tell you you know, what the analysis would have shown if you choose other variables and why they chose those variables and not others. And in fact, they don't tell you this. They just, you know, make some arbitrary choices that they don't explain and they get negative results and they publish the results as if they're solid, but they're not solid. Wow, that's really interesting how you analyze that. Are there other studies of, say, specific nutrients that would indicate um, to you that, you know, taking a specific nutrient like uh, iodine, I, I think, is one of your recommended nutrients. That that has shown benefits over the long term. Yeah, um, there's a number of studies. Um, I may as well say, first of all, some of the ones that are harmful to take. You know, okay. so there are there are also studies showing that you know taking certain things is harmful, and usually iron and folic acid are the most likely to be negative. Uh, and people have also had problems with vitamin A and vitamin E, uh, but in, uh, the vitamin E with high dose alpha tocopherol, uh, and the vitamin A was mostly in the past when people were getting you know high doses in multivitamins. Um, so uh, you know, but probably iron is the big thing that for older people it's a mistake to supplement. So I think a lot of women when they're menstruating or pregnant, uh, they find out they need extra iron because they don't eat enough red meat or seafood or liver uh, as much as they should. And so they get anemic and they start supplementing iron. But then after they stop menstruating, they don't need the iron anymore, but they keep taking it and that can be quite harmful. Um, so there are some supplements that are negative and then there are others that are positive uh, like iodine. And now iodine, you don't really need it if you eat a seafood rich diet, you know, like eat seaweed and seafood, uh, you know, fish, shellfish from the ocean. Okay. Um, but there's actually, um, uh, a lot of evidence that if you have big fluctuations in your iodine intake, then it can cause trouble. You know, so 
if you're deficient and then you give a large dose of iodine, then you can injure the thyroid. And so I kind of recommend a low level of iodine supplementation, uh, you know, like 200 micrograms a day, just to make it a habit in order to make sure that you're always getting some iodine. And then if you eat an iodine-rich meal, like uh, seafood with seaweed, uh, then that big influx of iodine won't cause any injuries to your thyroid, and that can help prevent various thyroid diseases. Okay. Yeah, that, that's one, one thing that I noticed while reading your book is you, you really look into the details of, okay, th this supplement seems to have a lot of positive benefits, and then you also look at the cons, and you look at what are the cons of taking too much, and you seems to be you only recommend supplementation with supplements that don't have um, any um, major side effects and so and uh, it's is that kind of your way of going about um, looking at the positives and negatives of supplements yeah yeah so um, the way our diet is structured it's really designed to optimize nutrition mm -hmm. and with every nutrient you can either be deficient or you can get an excess and in either case, you're going to be harmed by it. So uh, what we try to do is get every nutrient into what we call the peak health range, where you get all of the benefits but none of the toxicity or excess effects. And um, so that's what we're aiming for. And then we look at how much people typically get from food. And, um, and if the food gets them into the peak health range, then that's great. Then you don't need to supplement and shouldn't supplement. Uh, but if a lot of people are still deficient in certain things, and that's relatively easy to do if you don't eat seafood, you don't eat organ meats, um, or you don't eat a lot of vegetables. And, you know, so there's lots of people who don't eat much seafood, who don't eat liver, and who don't eat, don't like vegetables. So, you know, that's just a fact of, of life. So if you ate all of those, uh, then you really wouldn't need to supplement just about anything. Uh, the other one is sunshine. Uh, a lot of people don't get enough sunshine because they're working in the day or in the winter in the north. It's, it's impossible. Um, so, you know, vitamin D supplementation is beneficial for a lot of people. And, you know, so depending on your dietary habits, um, you know, if you eat plates and plates of vegetables a day like Terry Walls does, uh, she cured her multiple sclerosis with a very nutrient-rich diet. You know, then you wouldn't need to supplement anything uh, except maybe vitamin D. Uh, you know, but for other people, you know, a lot of us, you know, are very busy. We're working very hard. We don't want to spend a lot of time cooking. You know, vegetables, it actually takes quite a bit of time just to chop them up, you know, apart from the fact that a lot of people don't like the taste that much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so... Uh, when you look at the diets, you know, people actually like to eat, uh, you know, even if they're, like, perfect health diet based in structure, uh, you know, people often drop, uh, drop some things, and so it's easy to be a little nutrient deficient in a few key nutrients. And so that's why we suggest, um, you know, half a dozen uh, supplements for most people. Right. And Paul, you mentioned there that uh, vegetables are really important as far as getting your nutrients, but aren't a animal products also pretty important and contain some important nutrients? And is there a difference between animal versus vegetable nutrients? Yeah, I would say animal nutrients are actually the most important, and that's how we designed our diet around the animal foods first. You know, so get the best possible animal foods in the right mix including organ meats, including um, collagen from bone and joint material that you cook in soups and stews, egg yolks, um, a diversity of seafood. Um, and if you optimize things with the animal foods, then it turns out you don't really, for most nutrients, you don't really need all that many vegetables uh, in order to optimize nutrition. And the reason we think it's good to start with animal foods is, uh, first of all, people will always eat, if they can, a certain amount of animal foods. And because protein is a strong driver of appetite and animal foods are the best source, so people make sure they get, they get some of those. 
and we want to make sure we guide people to the right mix uh, of those. So that's very important uh, to get a really healthy mix of animal foods. And then once you've optimized the animal foods, then you find you know there's a relatively small number of nutrients that you really need from plants. And you know animal foods are really important because animals are structured just like us um, biologically. And that means just about every part of an animal is, is nutritious for us. Uh, so every body part of an animal has components that will nourish the corresponding body part in us. And, uh, you know, so, and also animals can't afford to harbor toxins that would be harmful to us. So there's a lot of benefit uh, to eating animal foods, and to, but especially if you eat them uh, in the right proportions, the right mix of animal foods. And so I would always start with animal foods as the basis of sound nutrition, uh, but then it turns out you can't totally optimize nutrition unless you're eating uh, plant foods as well. And vegetables, because they have so few calories, allow you to get a, a great deal of nutrition uh, you know, without very many calories. So you can add on vegetables to your diet and improve the nutritional quality quite a bit without uh, making yourself uh, too full or you know putting on weight. Um, and you know vegetables have side benefits and they have a lot of fiber and uh, that can promote a beneficial gut flora and help protect against colon cancer and uh, uh, a few other conditions. So. Um, you know, so it's good to it's good to get both animal and plant nutrition in balance. Um, I don't like the idea of getting nutrients primarily from plants because, in addition to having nutrients, plants tend to be toxin rich. Mm. So animals can't have toxins that are harmful to us. You know, even the animals that have venom, like venomous snakes, uh, they keep it in their mouth. And they uh, uh, and they make the venom digestible, so that you know if the snake accidentally swallows some venom, it gets digested and it doesn't harm the snake. Hmm. And so that's why if you know if you're in the desert and with a friend and one of you gets a rattlesnake bite, uh, you know it's fine to suck the venom out and swallow it yourself. You don't have to worry. Uh, it's only if it goes straight to the blood that. Uh, it's it's actually harmful, and so you know animal foods are generally very safe to eat, uh, and whereas plant foods can be less safe. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's, Paul, we're we're coming up on time here, and I I wanted to get to more things, but I think we might have to put that off to a different day, but. Um, you know, people out there listening, um, you know, Paul's book is really interesting, and uh, I'll put a link up on the podcast app. If you're listening right now, um, you can click on the link to download his book from Audible for free. But um, I, one thing before you go that I wanted to question you about, um, in the past we've had you on and talking about um, carbohydrates and fats and macronutrients, and um, we had a, a man on the show named Zach Bitter a few weeks ago who set the world record in uh, one for or the American record for 100 miles running in 11 hours and 47 minutes and he follows a low carbohydrate diet but then during racing he takes in carbohydrates and he set the world record doing that or the American record and now from what I heard from you in the past on the show is that if you don't eat a lot of carbohydrates during training you might lose some of that machinery that you need to process the carbohydrates and if you if you just stick with a really low carb diet, you might only be uh, uh, optimized for burning fat. What do you think about an athlete? I don't know. Have you heard of Zach? And what do you think about this train train low and then race on high carb? Yeah. Well, um, I haven't heard of Zach specifically, but uh, but that is a a sensible strategy for an endurance athlete. So for an Ultra endurance athlete, like a you know racing a hundred miles, you really do want to optimize fat, and so for training, you really want to you know optimize those fat metabolizing pathways, and you can do that by uh, eating low carb, and but then 
during the race, you want to provide every possible energy producing pathway, including the carb pathway. So, you know, in training, you starve the carb pathway to force uh, the fat pathway to get optimized. And in, uh, you know, athletic usage, you'll always use the fat uh, pathway until the cells get starved of oxygen. And, um, and so you want to make yourself as efficient as you can. Uh, you know, so training for fat utilization will improve your respiratory capacity, your ability to deliver oxygen to cells, um, and it will improve, uh, you know, give you a large transport machinery for transporting fats into mitochondria. Uh, so those are all beneficial for an endurance racer. Uh, and then once you have those adaptations, you know, then uh, eating carbs during the race gives you the carb pathway. It doesn't go away uh, just because you train without it. And in fact, uh, when people do carb loading, uh, the, the best way to do carb loading, uh, you know, even if you're uh, not normally on a low carb diet, is about three weeks before the race, go on a low carb diet and starve yourself of carbs, and then the body will think, oh, uh, we don't, we ran out of carbohydrates. That means we need to start storing more carbohydrates when they return to our diet, and cells make more glycogen reservoirs, you know, more places to store glycogen. And then when you do the carb loading in the three or four days before the race, you fill them up with uh, glycogen, and you have more glycogen than you would have without it. And, you know, so these kinds of strategies, they're, uh, you know, they're quite old, and they're well attested, and there's various ways, you know, you don't necessarily want to train exactly the same way that you race. Uh, you train in order to induce stresses that produce beneficial adaptations, uh, and you don't necessarily want to introduce stresses with the most stressful, you know, if you optimize everything for performance and training, then in order to introduce stresses, you have to really stress yourself. You know, whereas if you, say, starve yourself of carbs, uh, you know, just in one little thing, then you can stress yourself with much less intense work and get the beneficial adaptations without killing yourself. Um, and so a big part of athletic training is, uh, you know, getting the efficient adaptations without getting yourself injured or, uh, you know, stressed, worn out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for answering that, Paul. Uh, Paul, it, it's been great having you on the show today to talk about all the different nutrients and then how we can optimize carbohydrates during the past few weeks before a big race. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to mention before we close out um, as far as what you're working on next or where people should go to find out more about you? Well, uh, they can go to our website, perfecthealthdiet.com, and I'm working on a bunch of things which are getting close uh, to fruition. Um, I'm going to start a newsletter pretty soon. Um, I'll probably offer a free ebook on you know how to heal your gut, uh, which uh, should help me out because uh, I get like five questions a day from people with gut issues. Um, and um, also a bunch of things will be coming out soon. Uh, we're going to create uh, a series of video lecture courses and people should watch for that. Um, we're, my wife and I are working on a cookbook, and uh, in addition, um, we have a new uh, business called Perfect Health Retreats, and our next retreat is going to be in May on the beach in North Carolina on a private gated island. It'll be at the former vacation home of uh, Alec Baldwin and Kim Bassinger, and it's going to be uh, a really great experience, and um, so, and that's a great way to get, uh, you know, both a few weeks vacation and a great, uh, great location. But to learn all about perfect health diet and lifestyle advice, and to get uh, some real health improvements. So we've been doing these retreats at another location for six months, and everybody who's come has had really significant health improvements. And so, uh, you know, that was really exciting. 
So it turns out, you know, everybody who needed to lose weight has lost weight, and everybody who was obese uh, lost at least 10 pounds. And uh, you know, without without starving themselves and without intense exercise. So you know, we just do half an hour of exercise a day, um, or a little more, and uh, you know, eat a normal amount of perfect health diet food, and the weight just falls off of people. Um, so that was, you know, and that's been a really exciting experience, and now I'm really excited to, uh, you know, offer it in a new form that, uh, you know, should be a really great experience. Um, so that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. That sounds great, Paul. You know, I'd, I'd love to join you for one of those retreats sometime in the future. Um, I think in the past they were a month long. How long are they now? Uh, well, these will be two weeks. So one of the reasons we moved is that, uh, the the former place we were holding them uh, was residential zoned and they had a, a zoning limit. You could only do 30 day or longer stays. And so now we'll be uh, on a beachfront uh, location where we're free to rent, uh, you know, free to offer shorter stays, uh, like a, a two week stay. And two weeks seems to be enough to generate good health results. So everybody at our retreats had good health results you know, observable good health results by two weeks. And, you know, in shorter stays, sometimes, you know, people are jet lagged from flying in or, or things like that. So, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a week or something before people start seeing results. But two weeks should be a really good time, and it's enough time for us to cover our educational material. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul, they should they should start a TV program where they have uh, the Biggest Loser side by side of Perfect Health Retreat. Yeah, um, actually, my wife would really love to see that. She said uh, they should call it the Biggest Winner uh, <laughs> because you win in health terms. Yeah, that'd be great to see. I, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but that that would be fun to have the side by side uh, comparison with people eating delicious food on the Perfect Health diet and then uh, people starving themselves. With Jillian Michaels, I guess. Yeah, that's right. That would be a great comparison. You know, show them out on the beach at uh, Figure Eight Island in North Carolina, and uh, um, you know, re relaxing, enjoying the warm water, at, versus uh, you know all those tough workouts on The Biggest Loser. And you know, uh, The Biggest Loser can generate faster weight loss, you know, in, per week while they're doing that kind of program, but it's not necessarily healthy, and a lot of the people on The Biggest Loser have, you know, rebounded and regained weight after they went back home, you know, and it's not a sustainable program, the way they do things there, you know, they do it for television drama, you know, whereas we've had tremendous long-term uh, weight loss results, you know, where people normalize their weight and, you know, maintain normal weight indefinitely, um, you know, so it's much better to do things in a healthful way without starving yourself, you know, doing a normal amount of exercise. Um, and then you can, you know, create a lifetime of health and normal weight. Right, right. Well, Paul, it's been great talking with you again today. Thanks so much for being on the show. Okay, thank you, Aaron.